On the eve of Thanksgiving, November 24, 1971, a man calmly walked through a crowded terminal at Portland International Airport. The man walked up to the ticket counter of Northwest Orient Airlines and purchased a one-way ticket to Seattle. He identified himself to the ticket agent as Dan Cooper. While the flight was en route, the man quietly gave a written note to a stewardess that he was hijacking the plane, then opened his briefcase showing her a bomb. He then made several demands, including 200000 in cash and four parachutes. Later, while the plane was in the air, he put on one of the parachutes, strapped the money to himself with the cords from one of the remaining parachutes, then jumped out of the plane's rear staircase, never to be seen again. And that's just a short background on the case of D.B. Cooper. And as many of you already know, the name D.B. came from a media mistake from the early reporting on the case. And that obviously stuck, and the name D.B. Cooper has been legendary since. I have always been fascinated with the case of D.B. Cooper. I think I first heard about it on the show In Search Of with the host Leonard Nimoy of uh, Star Trek fame. Obviously, that was Mr. Spock. I love the story when he did it on In Search Of, and I believe Unsolved Mysteries also did an episode on the D.B. Cooper case just a few years later. I really picked up on the case again when they were having the anniversaries of it, and they would have guests on shows like Coast to Coast. They would have Galen Cook on talking about his suspect, William Gossett. And, of course, there was a big uh, TV show that came on the History Channel by a guy named Thomas Colbert, about his suspect, Robert Rackstraw, and there was a uh, lot of hoopla about him, which we'll get into a little bit shortly. I never really sat out to try to solve the D.B. Cooper case. I was just interested in it, but the more I read about it, I found out about a suspect that I really like, and the more I studied, I firmly came to believe he was D.B. Cooper. Around one day, I was reading some message boards on D.B. Cooper, which I never post on because all it is is a lot of infighting, but... Once in a while, you will see some good information on it, so I am one of those people who likes to read them, but will not join in the conversation. Everybody's kind of out for their own suspect and likes to take shots at the other people's suspect, and that's kind of fun to do, but sometimes it might get a little out of hand on some of these message boards, so you have various posters getting kicked off, getting back on under different names, and this kind of crazy thing going on, but uh, anyway, I digress, but I was on the D.B. Cooper message board called The Drop Zone, and uh, I believe it was Bruce Smith, who is the uh, venerable Grand Poobah of all things D.B. Cooper in the D.B. Cooper world. He's been studying the case for I, probably since it happened, I think. You know, he lives out there in the area in Portland where it happened, so he's knows all the characters involved with this uh, crazy set of, of people that uh, have immersed himself into this case. But anyway, he had posted on uh, this message board about one of the suspects he was kind of looking at by the name of Ted B. Braden. What really caught my attention with Braden was the fact that other commandos from Vietnam were the ones that put his name forward as being the most qualified to have made the D.B. Cooper jump. Specifically, two of them were Sergeant Billy Waugh and Major John Plaster. And if you look those guys up on on Google... Just look at their accomplishments that they've done, you know, in Vietnam and since. I think uh, Billy Waugh has had 25 years in the CIA special operations and 25 years is a U.S. Green Beret. Um, John Plaster has so many military awards, it, it fills up an entire page on Wikipedia. So to me, when two guys like that point to another guy that they know of saying, He's the one that's so outlandish and palsy and had the ingenuity and the jumping skills to pull off the D.B. Cooper ice. I take note. And this was an elite group. Ted Braden was a member of what they called the SOGS, which is, uh, stands for Studies and Observations Group. And that's defined as a highly classified, multi-service United States Special Operations Unit, which conducted covert, unconventional warfare operations prior to and during the Vietnam War. I mean, these guys were doing the really crazy stuff, jumping into places like Cambodia at night, cutting enemy uh, transmission wires, uh, you know, trying to uh, get prisoners. That's one of their main duties was going in to look for uh, POWs and getting them out. And remember, we weren't supposed to be in Laos or Cambodia, so uh, getting caught wasn't an option. So they looked at a guy like Braden who would take in teams of about eight guys, and he would be the leader, and he would get them out of there every single time 
without without even looking back. I mean, this guy was literally the first Rambo. He wasn't just big stocky guy like Sylvester Stallone, but he was every bit of a badass as uh, Rambo was. So the short story on Ted Braden is told in the 1967 October issue of Ramparts Magazine is that in late 1966, while he was in Vietnam, he went to a bar in Saigon and heard they were hiring mercenaries for, for good pay down in the Congo. So hearing this, he decided, hey, that's the ticket for me. I, as Ted said himself, I'm not here for the glory. I'm here for the money. So he was uh, drawing pay as a sergeant first class, and he said that he liked the first class thing, but it just wasn't paying enough. So he decided to go AWOL from Vietnam, leave Vietnam, goes back to the United States for a short uh, period over the you know, Christmas holiday and New Year's, and then uh, proceeds to head out towards the Congo. And he tells of all this, you know, how he got down there and everything. So not soon after he gets to the Congo, it was all over for Ted Braden. Somehow the CIA had tracked him down with the help of a Colonel Peters. As it turns out, according to Braden, they would have picked him up even without the desertion charge. Because apparently the CIA has no qualms about using mercenaries. But in the Congo, it's a big embarrassment for them to have American citizens down there fighting as mercenaries. So they arrest him. Put him up in a hotel for a while, interrogate him for about five days or so. Then they fly him back to the United States and put him in a stockade at Fort Dix. And this account of what happened to Ted Braden when he was in confinement at Fort Dix comes from a posting on a message board from somebody that got this uh, account from a Lieutenant Colonel Hank Burstich. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that last name correctly, but uh, Burstich quotes here in the... In the uh, text from the person that posted it he says what really struck me was Braden's very calm demeanor in his cell I remember him saying to me don't worry sir this will all work out clearly there was some external force taking care of Braden end quote I thought that was very interesting because here Braden is got picked up for desertion down there and fighting in the Congo as a mercenary which they didn't like on top of it and this uh, colonel gives an account of him being very calm Seems like he knows nothing really bad's going to happen to him. He said he had a TV set in his cell, which was almost was really unheard of at the time. He also said that uh, it was clear that Braden was getting some sort of special treatment and knew he was going to get out. And Braden was exactly right to believe that. And I'll quote Lieutenant Colonel Hank Burschitz again. And he says, On the day of the general court-martial of Braden was to begin, Post headquarters received a phone call from General Harold K. Johnson, U.S. Army Chief of Staff, directing the general court-martial not be convened. The alleged reason was an inability to secure the courtroom. With a sizable military police presence on Fort Dix, this reason appeared to be contrived. Since we were barred from trying Braden but had prima facie evidence to, do, to document his absence without leave, we needed somehow to dispose of him. Then Major Kenneth Allen Raby and the Staff Judge Advocate Office at Fort Dix found a provision in an Army regulation that would allow Braden to resign for the good of the service. Under this provision, Braden would receive a general discharge under honorable conditions, which is a step below an honorable discharge. This provision did include a bar to reenlistment so Braden could not re-enter the military. At first, Braden balked because of the bar to reenlistment, <coughs> but eventually agreed to resign. And I further want to quote two more paragraphs from the lieutenant colonel, and they state, and I quote, While Major Rabbi, who was a judge advocate general, JAG officer, was negotiating with Braden, the issue of Braden's special wristwatch came up. Braden asserted he was wearing the watch when he was apprehended in the Congo, but somehow it turned up missing, and Braden insisted it be returned before he would resign. Somehow Major Rabbi got Braden to resign, even though the wristwatch was apparently never found. End quote. I think that wristwatch was something special. The CIA probably gave him, and it had an altimeter on it, which you could see how that would later tie into to D.B. Cooper. That would come in really handy to, to someone jumping out of a plane at night to know what their altitude was. And the last paragraph I want to quote from Lieutenant Colonel is this, and I quote, On July 3rd, 1967, my XO First Lieutenant Hayes picked up Braden at the stockade and armed with a 45 caliber pistol, escorted him to the transfer station by way of the SPD. There was a Specialist First Class Ted B. Braden in his Class A uniform with green beret, blouse boots, numerous ribbons, 
master jump wings, etc., being escorted under guard. The Fort Dix Chief of Staff, Colonel David A. Gile, called the transfer station and ordered that Braden be moved ahead of all other out-processing personnel, regardless of their grade. When First Lieutenant Hayes returned to the SPD, he and I talked about the Braden case and agreed we would probably never know the complete details of what had transpired, end quote. And one more thing I would like to uh, point out that came from the uh, transcript from Lieutenant Colonel Hank Burstich was he speaks about seeing the uh, personnel records for Braden when he was at uh, Fort Dix with him. And he said he saw his general technical score and that it was 150. Now, that's almost as high as you can get on a GT score. And he, quote, and I say, he said, and I quote, I recall reviewing his DA Form 20 and being amazed to his general technical score which was above 150. The GT score is a good indicator of IQ. He said, I knew Braden was highly intelligent. His DA Form 20 also showed he had three years of college at the University of Toledo. Ted Braden was from, uh, from Ohio, by the way. So now one may ask, what does this have to do with D.B. Cooper? Well, anything and everything. You could, as you can see, Ted Braden was highly adept at things. The CIA didn't want him talking. He was highly intelligent. We pointed that out. Well, D.B. Cooper was highly intelligent. How do we know that? Well, one thing he did was ask for his uh, his ransom notes back. That, that's, that's really smart. It has his handwriting on him. Of course he wanted them back, and he specifically asked for them back. Uh, another thing that points to his intelligence is he came up with this caper in the first place. No one had ever thought about hijacking a jet for ransom and jumping out of the aft stair of a, of a Boeing 727. That's unheard of. It took a lot of intelligence just to come up with the idea in the first place. Uh, another thing he did was he asked for four parachutes, not just one or two as a backup. He asked for four, which made the people think, well, he could take hostages with him. Highly intelligent guy. So I want to go back now to the, uh, the Ramparts article, which I have somewhere right in front of me. So now switching back again to the Ramparts article, I just want to read the beginning of this just to give you an idea of how adept he was at jumping out of an airplane of any of any form. And it starts like this, and it's writ actually it's written as a, an advertisement for himself as a as a as a, a a job wanted ad, and it starts like this: Mercenary soldier, 14 years military service, available for position immediately. Qualifications. 101st Airborne Division, World War II, Master Parachutist, 911 log jumps, including 695 free falls, ex-lieutenant and ex-sergeant, U.S. Army, operated in four countries in Southeast Asia and two in Africa, experience in the use of U.S. weapons, demolitions, sabotage, infiltration, specialty is training and directing hunter-killer teams, 23 months of jungle operations in and out of Vietnam, willing to organize and or direct insurgency or counterinsurgency teams, whichever is appropriate to non-CIA supported employer. References can be checked with U.S. Army, U.S. Special Forces, CIA, and 5 Commando, Congo. Other talents by confidential inquiry only. Absolute loyalty guaranteed to highest bidder. Contact Ted B. Braden. There you have it. I mean, that's just the beginning of this article showing you what this guy could do. And I mean, it, it, it further goes, and I want to read this, to show you the kind of jumper that he was and the kind of jumper D.B. Cooper was, who I think is the same person. So this reads, Braden is among those professionals who appear to have a secret death wish, coupled with well-trained instincts for survival. He continually places himself in unnecessary danger, but always manages to get away with it. At one time, he was forbidden to free fall for violating safety regulations. The rules state a jumper must pull and be in the saddle before he reaches 2,000 feet. Braden makes a habit of waiting until he is well below 1,000 feet. Falling at 174 feet a second, if his main chute malfunctioned and he pulled his reserve, he would have to run the last 100 feet to get it open. With no safety restrictions on jumping in Vietnam, he had a ball. Similarly, on operations deep in NLF territory, he wandered away from his team on at least two occasions, the better to seek trouble. 
Wow, that's pretty amazing. That tells you this guy is not scared of doing something as crazy as what D.B. Cooper did, jumping out of that plane, a jet, no like, you know, no less, with, with ransom money into bad weather un, in unfamiliar territory. This is the person that could have done it. I mean, D.B. Cooper wasn't on a death wish. He wanted to get some money and survive to be able to spend that money. Now, with all that being said about Ted B. Braden, keep in mind that with every D.B. Cooper suspect, the evidence for them or against them is all circumstantial evidence. There is no hard evidence for who D.B. Cooper may have been. There's, there just doesn't exist. I think they may have a, or claim they have a little bit of DNA, I think, from a drinking cup that he left. He did smoke quite a few cigarettes uh, during the caper that were Raleigh uh, filter tip cigarettes. And somehow the, the cigarette butts have disappeared from the FBI's possession. No one knows where they are. They'll probably never turn up, which makes you wonder why they, they're trying to protect whoever that is or maybe never want him to be uh, conclusively found. But all that being said... It's all circumstantial, and including mine with Braden. I'm just putting out there that of, of all the suspects, he's easily the best jumper from from any type of aircraft, far and above any other suspect. And there's a couple other couple others that I'll mention later that are really accomplished jumpers, but not at the level of, of Ted Braden, not even close. Uh, back in the 19 early 1960s, he was a member of the, the uh, a military jumping team called the Golden Arrows that would compete all through Europe and uh, skydiving competitions and he pretty much won every one of them he is the best uh, probably one of the best paratroopers ever so that being said i want to look at the db cooper letters which have not been really studied enough over the years and i think uh, i think they've come back into uh play as recently as uh thomas colbert's uh insertion of robert rackstraw being db cooper who i will adamantly tell you he's not and he wasn't and he recently passed away and shockingly did not give a deathbed confession that he was db cooper so with that being said i would like to read what's called uh, db cooper letter number six and it was written march 28 1972 just a few short months after the hijacking it was sent to the portland oregonian newspaper it reads gentlemen this letter is to let you know I am not dead, but really alive and just back from the Bahamas, so your silly troopers up there can stop looking for me. That is just how dumb this government is. I like your articles about me, but you can stop them now. D.B. Cooper is not real. I had to do something with the experience Uncle taught me, so here I am, a very rich man. Uncle gave too much of it to world idiots and no work for me. I had to do it to relieve myself of frustration. I went out of the system and saw a way through good old Unk. Now you know. I am going around the world and they will never find me because I am smarter than the system's lackey cops and lame duck leaders. Now it is Uncle's turn to weep and pay one of its own some cash for a change. And please tell the lackey cops D.B. Cooper is not my real name. Sincerely, a rich man. So now, after reading that, and for those of you playing along at home, I'd like to read the last paragraph written by Ted B. Braden in the Ramparts Magazine article and see if you can pick up on some of the same things I did after comparing the two. And this reads, I need work, and I don't mean driving somebody's truck. There's a great need for people with my talents, but unfortunately, the CIA is doing the hiring or the others because of the CIA lack the funds to make a contract interesting. Evidently, I'm on the agency's blacklist, and that makes it difficult to contact other employers from this country. Those who can use my help in Latin America are trying to fight using indigenous and foreign idealists, which means no money for the professionals. It's too bad Strasner, Rojas, and Somoza are in so tight with, in quotes, Sam. Otherwise, they would pay well. I'd like to go back to the Congo, but I don't think they'll let me. Too bad, because the anti- Mobutu boys are making a bundle, end quote. Well, if you can see there, the first thing that, that struck me was he uses the phrase Uncle Sam and boils it down to just Sam versus the Cooper letter where he says uh, Uncle and Unk. That, I can't stress enough how rare that is, is to, to reference Uncle Sam by using either Unk or, or Uncle or Sam. It's obvious in the D.B. Cooper letter that he's talking about Uncle Sam, 
He's got to do with something with the experience Uncle taught me. And then now here he is, a very rich man, telling you it's all about the money. Sounds a lot like Ted Braden in that last paragraph, doesn't it? Because he wanted to be a mercenary because of the money. Well, adding to this unusual use of language in both the D.B. Cooper letter number six and the Ramparts magazine article was a paragraph in the beginning of the article, which was the foreword written by the military editor of uh, Ramparts magazine, whose name was Donald W. Duncan. And Duncan was a Green Beret master sergeant who came home from Vietnam as a disillusioned hero in 1965. He became a leading early opponent of the war and he pretty much died in obscurity in a, in a small town. I think it was in Indiana, all but forgotten. But uh, Duncan had known Braden earlier in Vietnam, and that's that's kind of how they came to, to get together to do this this article about Braden. And I want to read a paragraph real quick, which was you know the foreword that was written by uh, Donald Duncan, and it says, Braden has a penchant for asking incredible favors of people, whether they be short or long-term acquaintances. On what started out to be a normal day at Rampart's offices, he walked in with a dunk, old buddy, in quotes, to ask for help. He blithely explained he was looking for a new mercenary group to join, and could I help tide him over, question mark. Well, obviously, there's Braden asking for money, but uh, more interestingly, he called Donald Duncan dunk, D-U-N-C. Sounds a lot similar to unk. And Donald Duncan did not go by the nickname Dunk. He went by Don. It's in everything written about him. It'll put Don in quotes like I did on the photo of him. He only went by Don, which was short enough. It was Braden just had a peculiar habit of shortening names to maybe seem like he knew someone better than he did or just uh, a little uh, a quirk that he had. So one last item of comparison I have between the D.B. Cooper letter number six and the Ramparts article are what I call descriptive insult phrases. And I have these up on the screen. You can see in the D.B. Cooper letter, he uses the terms silly troopers, world idiots, lame duck leaders, lackey cops. He used that twice. And then in the Ramparts article, Braden uses the terms chair bound commandos empire builders, bureaucratic bunglers, and competent Vietnamese officers and officials. You can see not only does this person have the same worldview or the things he's talking about, but he even uses the same phrases. He uses a lot of alliteration. You know, if you see bureaucratic bunglers and lame duck leaders, uh, it's just obvious to me this is the same author. It's just, it's, it's glaring. And if you look at just uh, something as simple as a, a world idiot, what does that mean, world idiots? We all know what idiots mean, but what is a world idiot? This is somebody that's been out in the world, traveled the world, been doing different things. You can tell from the uh, Ramparts article, he's not happy with the CIA who's running all these small governments all around the world. That's why they're ha you know fighting these wars in the Congo to take them over. So you can easily see where you would come up with the world idiots. And you could also see what uh, the motivation would have been for Braden to have been D.B. Cooper and hijacked that plane. It was all about money and the experience Experience, uncle taught him you know they taught him how to be this incredible soldier with all these skills and after he was kicked out of the army and not being able to re-enlist now what can he do all he can do is go drive a truck but how can he go make money with all these incredible talents that he had that were brought out by the military well guess what i'm gonna go uh, hijack a jumbo jet and ask for two hundred thousand dollars and i just might get away with it it just all makes perfect sense. So with that all being said, I want to take a few shots at some of the other suspects. And you'll see uh, how some of this will even tie back into the other D.B. Cooper letters. And there's really only two that you can even compare. And that would be letter number five and letter number six that we have been talking about. And you'll see how different those two are because there's a really the only two typewritten letters of, of any length at all. The, some of the other letters you might be familiar with that D. they claim D.B. Cooper may have written were the uh, one was the Playboy letter where it says system that beats a system and it was letters cut out from Playboy, of course. There was one where he claimed that he had just seen the Grey Cup up in Canada. But the main thing that ties the first five letters together, and I don't think that the, the first five are all written by the same person, and I don't think D.B. Cooper wrote the first five letters, obviously, but they all are signed D.B. Cooper, and we all know that the real name was Dan Cooper, and then that was a made-up name in of itself, but remember, D.B. was just a, screw, a media screw-up early on in the case, but they are all signed D.B. Cooper, and in the sixth letter, he says, D.B. Cooper is not real. D.B. Cooper is not my real name, and that he's writing this letter to let you know that I'm not dead, but I'm alive. 
So that right there separates it from all the previous five letters because he wouldn't have to let us know that he was still alive if he wrote any of any of the first five letters. So this ties me back into uh, going after one of the the last brought up subjects by Mr. Uh, Thomas Colbert, which was Robert Rackstraw. And Robert Rackstraw just recently passed away. God rest his soul. Did not, as I said earlier, give a give a deathbed confession that he was D.B. Cooper. But one of the main pieces of, uh, of their so-called, I guess they, I think they claim to have 90 pieces of circumstantial evidence. And remember, that's all anybody has. That's all I have. That's all they have. It's all circumstantial. But they claim to have 90 pieces of circumstantial evidence regarding uh, Robert Rackstraw. And one of the top pieces of circumstantial evidence that they put forward were two of the D.B. Cooper letters, one being letter number five and the one we talked about earlier, letter number six. And one member of uh, Thomas Colbert's team of 100 investigators was an ex-Vietnam commander. I'm not sure what his rank was, but his name is Rick Sherwood. And Rick claims to have been a uh, you know Vietnam code person. And he said, I think he said he was one of... Uh, Robert Rackstraw's platoon leaders or something at the time in Vietnam and Rick Sherwood had analyzed letter number five and letter number six and said that it's clear to him that it was Robert Rackstraw hiding his name and, and his uh, unit numbers in codes in letter number five and six and he pointed to number five saying that if you add certain numbers up it'll come up with units that only Robert Rackstraw was in during Vietnam and then when you move on to letter number six, he uses phrases, and, and funny enough, he uses the one, I went out of the system and saw a way through good old Unk. He somehow extrapolates that as, I am Lieutenant Robert Rackstraw. I mean, if you use all these weird codes and numbers and things like that, you could you could find out that Gary Coleman from Different Strokes was D.B. Cooper if you, if you try hard enough. I mean, this stuff just reminds me of Bible codes. It's really total nonsense. And what really shows that it's nonsense is that they're both using letter five and letter six to try to tie Robert Rackstraw into these letters. So here we'll put up letter five real quick, and you can see that the entire sentiment of the letter is different. He starts out with saying, sirs, letter six, he says, gentlemen. They are both typed, but in letter five, he says things like, my life has been one of hate, turmoil, hunger, and more hate. This seemed to be the fastest most profitable way to gain a few grains of, of peace of mind. He says, I don't blame people for hating me for what I've done, nor do I blame anybody for wanting to, for wanting me to be caught and punished. This, though this could never happen. I mean, you can see the sentiment is completely different. This, le this letter number five is totally apologetic. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I have 14 months to live. And by the way, Robert Rackstraw only died a few months, short months ago, not 14 months after. So I guess he would have just lying about this part. Also, as I said, letter number six was written to say, hey, I'm, I'm alive. Why would he need to do that if he was also the, the writer of number five? The, the, the two letters are polar opposites in so many ways. I mean, the, the terminology is different. Five is obviously signed D.B. Cooper. When six says D.B. Cooper is not my real name, D.B. Cooper's not real. So that's just one of many things that rule out Robert Rackstraw. And that's what they put as one of their biggest pieces of evidence is taking all these codes out of uh, five and six, which is ridiculous because you have to assume Rackstraw wrote them both to have embedded codes in them. And I really don't think Rackstraw was that smart. I'm not trying to insult the guy, but he, he wasn't. He didn't probably have a, D, a GT score of 150, probably nowhere close. You know, he was a pretty accomplished guy over in Vietnam, did a lot of crazy stuff. He shot down an elephant, bragged about it. Seems a little kind of, kind of, uh, uncivil to me i don't i think db cooper is a little more suave a little more sm smarter than that also robert ragstraw had a long criminal history so if he was this master outlaw and this uh this sly criminal why did he have so many offenses on his record i mean i think he got a, it was arrested for attempted murder of his father-in-law he had a, he had a he had a really long rap sheet to be such a master criminal it just makes no sense and another glaring thing against him was his age he was 28 years old at the time of the hijacking and i'll put up that that, uh, that one picture i have of him because that one is dated just one month before the hijacking and you can tell he does not look in his mid 40s and every witness that saw D.B. Cooper, especially the the, the the key witnesses, which were Tina Mucklow, Florence Schaffner, the two stewardesses that saw him the most. Obviously, Tina was with him the longest time. Uh, 
said that D.B. Cooper was in his mid-40s. And obviously Robert Rackstraw was 28 and still looked 28. If you could look at that picture that was just taken a month before. He could have been wearing makeup, but I think someone like Tina Mucklow that sat next to him for that long would have noticed that. And, uh, you know, by comparison, Braden was 44 years old. And also to get into uh, the height of D.B. Cooper, uh, you know, they, they, you see all these estimates where he was as, as tall as six feet. Well, remember, he was sitting. And also, if you go back to the original transcripts of the FBI records from the D.B. Cooper hijacking uh Tina Mucklow, when first asked what his height was when they interviewed her in Reno when the plane landed, she said 5'8". And we know Braden was 5'9", because the lieutenant colonel that saw him uh, in Fort Dix said he was pretty much eye-to-eye -eye with him, and he was 5'9". He said maybe just a, possibly a little bit shorter, so definitely no less than 5'8". And also going to uh, the description passenger Bill Mitchell gave, who was the college student who famously said that he remembered D.B. Cooper as having a uh, turkey neck or a sagging chin was the exact phrase I think they, the FBI wrote down when he saw Cooper on the plane. And they said he had the most relaxed view of being that he didn't know the plane was being hijacked and he had the best, best view of D.B. Cooper. But going back to height, uh, Bill Mitchell said the initial estimates from him were 5'9 and 5'10. So it looked like the FBI was always trying to skew the height higher for some reason. It's, to me, maybe maybe they were trying to hide something. But anyway, uh, with Rackstraw, just don't think that was, that was, that was D.B. Cooper. And that's going to wrap it up for part one of a two-part series on the drop on D.B. Cooper. Thanks for watching. If you like what you heard, please go check out a podcast called The Cooper Vortex. I have an episode on there called D.B. Cooper Was a Mercenary about Ted Braden. The Cooper Vortex is a project by host Darren Schaefer and audio engineer Russell Colbert, and it's the best thing going in the D.B. Cooper world, and it's bringing new generations to the legend of D.B. Cooper. Please go check that out. Oh.